If you had to guess, how many times does the word holy appear in Scripture? Unless my exhaustive concordance is lying to me, it is in there 665 times. And that's not even counting holiness, just holy. And where to even begin with the sorts of serious examples where the word holy is used? Exodus, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic and holy? Leviticus, for I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. And Peter, of course, repeats this when he writes in 1 Peter, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Isaiah, the holy God, shows himself holy in righteousness. Elsewhere in Isaiah, the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. And again, to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Ezekiel, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. And then that tripartite song of worship in Isaiah and Revelation declared in praise, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So God is holy, His name is holy, His very triune being is holy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. His deeds are holy, He seeks to vindicate His holiness. All of creation is called to be holy, to worship God in the holiness of His splendor. Do you know where that word first appears in Scripture? For it's all of God and Scripture importance. Do you know the first thing consecrated as holy? Will you stand with me as we read Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3? Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished His work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all His work that He had done in creation. The Word of the Lord. You may be seated. Chapter 2 of Genesis begins with a single sentence that contains the entire universe. The heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. God has singularly caused all to be. And one of the reasons for including this in the creation account especially that phrase at the end, all the host of them, meaning the heavenly hosts, the sun and the moon and the stars, the constellations and colors of sunrise and sunset, the northern lights, the kaleidoscope of light and beauty and mystery for those who have ever been able to look up and see the Milky Way in the sky. The reason for including that was to show God's authority and sovereignty over them all. So therefore, in contrast to the Egyptians, for example, the heavenly hosts were not objects of worship, the sun god or the moon god, etc. But rather, who was to be worshipped was the sovereign, the commander, the ruler of the heavenly hosts, Yahweh, the one true God. And then, like in much of Scripture, 
the amount of literary artistry being done in those next two sentences is incredible. Many of you are familiar with the significance of numbers in Scripture. Now, many have taken what does have significance and sort of run with them to some wacky ends, treating Scripture as some sort of national treasure movie plot and seeing things that aren't intended at all. And I don't mean to give credence to some of that. But what can be said on solid theological ground is that in Scripture, seven often represents a sort of perfection. Six, think Revelation 666, devil, represents a sort of anti-perfection. And something repeated three times has similar connotations to the perfection of seven. So think holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So verses two to three. On the one hand, we're talking about the seventh day. And so in that alone, there is this sort of perfection intended. The heavens and the earth and the heavenly hosts are finished. But to add even more emphasis, that designation of the seventh day is repeated three times. So verse 2, on the seventh day. And then later in verse 2, he rested on the seventh day. And then verse 3, so God blessed the seventh day. So it's this compounding of emphasis on perfection. Something related to seven being repeated three times. Perfection upon perfection. And that alone is trying to get the reader's attention to the importance of this day. But that's not all. Because this isn't just any day. Verse 3, God blessed the seventh day, and underline this, and made it holy. Both of those additions, to bless and make holy, it only occurs on the seventh day. And each of those words open up some pretty fascinating suggestions. To God blessing a day, and what that was to me, you have to look back at where else God blesses anything up to this point in Scripture. It happens earlier in chapter 1, verse 23, where God blesses birds of the air and creatures of the sea, and with that blessing comes God's declaration to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters and the air of the earth. And then again, in chapter 1, verse 28, where God blesses the union of male and female, and with that exact same language comes God's word to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. So blessing in the Genesis account is connected with life and fertility and fruitfulness. And so to connect blessing to a day suggests ways in which the day itself might contribute to life and fruitfulness and bounty and fertility. John Golden Gay, a tremendous Old Testament scholar from Fuller, I've quoted him often, <laughs> he takes it one provocative, but in line with the text, he takes it one step further. You can read between the lines here. He says, quote, if blessing suggests making fruitful, blessing the seventh day has suggestive implications, hinting that God ordained that happy consequences attach to the seventh day's celebration. So take that as you will, husbands and wives. God blesses the day, verse 3, and made it Holy. Now, holy, of course, at its simplest means set apart. And so this day is holy, consecrated, set apart 
from the other days. And this is the first time that incredibly consequential word appears in all of Scripture. And so we dismiss the significance of that word connected with this day to our own peril. But holy, why? And if we honestly didn't know what was coming next in verse 3, what would we guess? Why would this day be holy? Because what? Because why? Because of some incredible work of creation God did on that day? Or maybe it's holy because He calls all of creation to worship Him on that day? Would we ever guess that it's holy, end of verse 3, because... This is a simple sentence. Because on it God rested from all His work that He had done in creation. Andy Crouch, evangelical author, he says, quote, The holiness of God is revealed not just in what He does, but how He rests. The seventh day is made holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now I get the impression because I too have internalized it similarly before that when we're implored to rest to honor a Sabbath in our lives We hear that, we internalize that like someone telling us to eat our vegetables. We agree it's good for us, it would likely benefit us, but it's not some huge deal if you don't. And perhaps some of us even secretly roll our eyes that, I mean, okay, it's probably important, but but, but calm down, it's not that important. And so long as we receive the call to rest and honor Sabbath as advice, as a recommendation, or as some good idea, then we significantly misunderstand Genesis 1 and 2. Wayne Muller, ordained minister, a licensed Therapist in his book on Sabbath, I believe he rightly notes, quote, to remember the Sabbath is not a burdensome requirement, but rather a remembrance of a law that is firmly embedded in the fabric of nature. It is a reminder of how things really are, the rhythmic dance to which we unavoidably belong. To be told to eat your vegetables is not the same as to be told to drink water or to breathe oxygen. One is good practice. The other is a necessity. One is advice. The other is describing something intrinsic to our nature. And the gap between those two is similar to the gap between our usual understanding of rest and Sabbath and actually more where it should be. What Genesis 2 chapters 1, excuse me, what Genesis 2 verses 1 to 3 is describing is not advice and it's not describing a good practice, but it is describing a part of reality, something that's intrinsic to creation. God's blessing and making holy a day of rest is shaped into creation itself. Now some thoughts as to why we miss that, how we've been malformed to think and live otherwise and ways to reclaim this in our lives. What was intended with rest is for next week. But you will not properly wait any of that, any of those suggestions, 
and give the sort of stakes to it that you should so long as you keep thinking of rest as some sort of Bible tip. Because it's not a Bible tip. What is being described here is a day, an entire day, like there are other days, meaning what is being described is fundamental to all of creation. This is why the title is what it is in your bulletin. Created with rest. Just as we are created along with light and darkness, the sun and the moon, the stars, the waters and dry land, plants and trees, fruits and vegetables, birds and fish and animals, so too were we created with rest. It's not optional. It is a day. It is this block of creation, just like there are other days and blocks of creation. It's not optional, just like the sun and the moon are not optional, just like all the other elements of creation are not optional. If we actually wanted to talk about there being any difference, it would be in the opposite way that our lives probably demonstrate. Far from the seventh day being less important or rest being more negotiable as a sort of recognition in our lives than the day of creating the sun and moon, for, exist, uh, for example, or the day of the seas and dry land, this seventh day is more important. It should be less negotiable than however we would think of the creation of the sun and the moon. The seventh day is the only day that God blesses and makes holy. If God sees fit to consecrate something as holy, the first anything in Scripture besides His very being that is said, this is holy, we would be wise to pay close attention to it in our own lives. You remember from the very beginning of this movement of sermons that the ultimate aim of Genesis 1 is to communicate order and function. That the question being asked in Genesis 1 is not primarily how, in the sense of astrophysics and astronomy and astrobiology. It's not how did all of this come to be, but why and what for and how is it supposed to function. Again, this is John Walton in his incredible book, The Lost World of Genesis 1. He says, quote, People in the ancient Near East did not think of creation in terms of making material things. Instead, everything is function-oriented. Consequently, to create something, to cause it to exist, in the ancient world means to give it a function. And we understand this in modern ways in, in countless examples. You know, what is a chair? Well, it's not simply, we would not say a chair is just this collection of materials. It's like a chair is something you sit on. We define it by its function. What's a bed? Again, it's not just a collection of materials. It's something to be laid on. What's a refrigerator? It's not just this, you know, collection of circuitry and assembly of parts, but it's something to keep things cold. We understand something being created for function. So to include this blessed, holy day of rest is to communicate something profound about the right order and function of creation, all of creation. That life, God ordered life and lived in harmony with how creation was always intended from the beginning is life that honors that blessing and holiness of rest and Sabbath. Notice I'm not saying the Sabbath. That will take some time to unpack as you are aware that Jesus himself unpacks in the New Testament. My suspicion is that for many of us, we have not given this part of creation its just due. We do not live lives that honor that divine blessing and holiness 
of rest and Sabbath. And therefore, we're not functioning as we were always intended. We, of course, see some sort of minimum of rest and Sabbath as necessary. Perhaps you've heard it said, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Certainly that attitude will get you there faster. We do not see its intended fullness as necessary. We do not see it, as Wayne Muller said, as a law firmly embedded in the fabric of nature. And we suffer from that, and everything and everybody that we encounter suffers because of it. Our families suffer from it. Our work suffers from it. Our life and joy suffer from it. We live rest-deficient lives. And we're more anxious, angry, distracted, and weary because of it. If you ever ask in your life, why am I so tired? The answer might not be so complicated. To another previous consideration, when we looked at the Genesis account of the blessing of limits, we have not honored this one and this limit We have cut ourselves off from God's blessing. We have rebelled against it with the naive human arrogance that we're some exception to something God himself did. Rest. Indeed, in our lives, just to bring equal, just to make even, in our understanding of how we think of rest and honoring Sabbath, with other fundamental elements of creation? That alone would probably, certainly would in my life, that alone would require some change. Because we don't naturally think that they're equal. We don't naturally approach rest and Sabbath that way. In some ways, we devalue it compared to other elements of creation. How many times in your life, if the choice is, I need rest, or I need to get this thing done. How many times does get this thing done win out? But even to make equal would not be far enough. Because it's not equal. It's even more important. God has blessed and made holy this day, this block of creation... Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. For the way or ways in which God might be leading you to course correct in your life unto one that honors rest and Sabbath, we have the privilege this morning of considering it through the gift of communion. Rest and Sabbath, like all elements of creation that we have considered, they continue and expand in some ways like three-dimensionally as you work through the rest of Scripture and as future movements of sermons will consider and show. And the arc of this element of rest and Sabbath ultimately lands at the invitation of the one with arms extended who says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I, Jesus, will give you rest. Jesus, the one who dismantles the legalism of the Sabbath, but nevertheless models in his life a radical life of Sabbath and a restful life. So however God might be stirring you to course correct, it will begin with taking that invitation of Jesus' seriously. That only with Jesus will you begin to know the blessing and holiness of God's rest. 
And in the elements of communion, the bread symbolizing His body broken for you, the cup, His blood shed for you, you get to taste and see the length to which Jesus went to defeat sin, to restore life as it was always intended unto eternity and within that today to give you rest. If you've not received a packet, let a deacon know as they come through in the aisle. And remember, to partake in this is to indeed recognize the one unto whom these symbols point to, a crucified Lord Jesus. Crucified and risen with an invitation to all to know life with Him by grace through faith. So if you're going to participate, that should mean something to you. Our process, like last month, we're going to have a time of reflection for you to be with Jesus in prayer, to repent to open your hearts to what Jesus might have to communicate to you in your partaking. And if I may gently suggest what you might bring before the Lord in prayer. Ask Jesus, are you living a life that honors God's intended rest? And ask Jesus where to begin by His grace and power and life with you where to begin to course correct. After a time of reflection, I will lead us simply in taking the elements together. And then we'll have our invitation and final song together. So would you bow your heads in this time of reflection, pray, listen, and receive.